Hi, I'm Coach Mia, and welcome to another special edition of GLOW 365 TV, our three-part documentary entitled The Choice to Live, a Warriors of Hope and Wellness in Raising Awareness for Mental Health Awareness Month in May, brought to you by Ribbons of Survivors 365. I will be your moderator for this show. Just want to remind you to like and subscribe on YouTube at Official KUO Magazine. There you can see all our current and previous show. Now allow me to introduce our host for this evening's show. They're self-empowerment educators, straight talking, and life coaches. Up first is um, Leonard Burge. He is a soul therapist a psycho-spiritual coach, a consultant, author of the book, Disease is the Cure, and Dean of Coily Works, along with advisor, producer, assistant writer of Glow 365 shows and all of KU Magazine shows. Hey, Lenny, how are you doing? Well, we got you on mute here. Well, thank you so much for having me back. Appreciate it. Well, thank you. Welcome back again. And next up is Sophia Green, AKA Sophie G. She is a certified life coach, a certified life purpose coach, relationship coach, producer and host of the Sophie G radio show and co-host, assistant writer, producer of Glow 365 TV shows and our mental health documentary shows. Welcome Sophie. Hi guys, hey Glow team. So glad to have you. So, um, Lenny, can you share um, what's coming up? We know we have a special tribute to someone special that we um, miss and love so much. Well, yes, uh, you know, I'm sad to announce for those of you who, who haven't heard that our dear friend and our dear uh, leader, Kujatere Kweli, deceased uh, last week. And um, we want to say that we're so thankful for all of the energy and work he put into allowing us to be here today. 50 years of work in the TV and broadcast business. Quayley Works is the name of our group. And the word Quayley means truth. And the beautiful thing about Kujatele, that's his real name, Kuj, as we know him, is that uh, he was dedicated to truth and he wanted, like all of us, to dedicate our series of programs to revealing and exposing the truth that you don't always hear. And so, uh, again, we know that he's in a better place. And I believe somebody told me that uh, they kind of sense that he's looking down on us and saying, I'm still with you. Thank you, Coach. Thank you so much, um, Lenny, for sharing those inspiring words of our dear, you know, brother Cooch. I'm truly grateful for, you know, all that he has taught me uh, along with my GLOW team. I know they feel the same way. His legacy will definitely will continue within all of us as we move forward. But um, very sad news. I want to take a moment of silence, you know, for the deadly shooting that happened um, in Texas elementary school. And um, let's just pause for a moment. We definitely want to send our prayers to all the families for the young children that have lost their lives. And um, I just can't imagine, you know, as a parent, you know, having to go through that and, you know, losing a child. But we definitely, again, um, keep him in our prayers. Now, on the last um, episode on May 10th, part one entitled Suicide, The Road Not Taken, we heard two powerful stories from coach Don Hewitt and Ruby Mayberry having thoughts of suicide. Can Sophie and um, both of you just give us a you know quick recap on the last one, starting with uh, Lenny? 
Okay, uh, before I give you the brief recap, let me speak from the psychological, the psycho-spiritual point of view that I've learned from some of my mentors. Uh, and it may be helpful for those who know of anyone thinking of suicide or themselves have contemplated, contemplated suicide. The inner thoughts of the suicidal person is that when they die, the whole world dies. Therefore, there's no need for too much consideration about who comes after. We'll get into that later. But some very beautiful points came out. And I'll start with an overall point. You know, disease as we know it in this world, and we lead, our communities lead in the three main diseases, heart disease, uh, diabetes, high blood pressure and heart and uh, cancer, and a, and a host of other diseases. But that's not the only dis disease that we suffer from. I authored a book called The Disease is the Cure. And believe it, oppression, suppression, poverty, all of those things are dis-ease. And one of the things that we came out of the last session was that there is in fact an emotional component of dis-ease which contributes to thoughts of suicide in those who contemplate it. And it also came out that suicide is not just that one final act, but we can actually live our life in a way that we're dying slowly instead of in one bang. It came out that some of our guests, uh, and, and a lot of people can probably identify with this, have been bullied in life, uh, maybe have had speaking disorders, stuttering, uh, people making fun of them, and the tra trauma coming from domestic violence and abuse, emotional neglect, eating disorders, um, deaths in the family. So it's it, these are all contributors to the decision to take one's life. Uh, however, we should be aware that there are resources available that we may not even be aware of. There are resources, there are hotlines, there are friends, there's therapy that's available, even for people who can't afford it. Even some of your hospitals and clinics have resources available. So uh, it's very important that families uh, take notice of what's going on around them with the people who you love so that you can see the signs. And I think hopefully in today's session, we'll get a little deeper into what signs can you see within yourself, but for our audience in yourself and others in the community that are alerts to you to do something that would avert these catastrophes of suicide? Thank you. Yeah, and um, you know, again, you know, if you missed last week, uh, we had some really intense conversations, and you know, we had uh, Ruby. I'm going to call them by first names and Don, Don Hewitt and Ruby Mabry. And up to actually, uh, Doc was on as well. And some of the takeaways that I will share is that, um, you know, the American Association, um, it's been documented that there's one in every five persons in the US that actually is suffering from mental illness or mental wellness issues um, and even contemplate suicide. You know, um, the fact that uh, one of the things that we discovered is that, you know, we heard our brother Lenny talk about disease, um, that if persons who are actually suffering with any kind of a disease, especially if it can be life changing, it usually contributes to mental, the mental health and wellness, and even lead to those kind of uh, thoughts because of their health feel so deteriorated, they feel, usually feel so helpless and useless. You know, we heard the fact that you can't, uh, I think it was uh, Ruby who, who said, you can't heal what you can't reveal. You know, just simply some, some uh, and, and remember that behind every depression, there's actually someone who's wearing a mask. So with that being said, and I know we're gonna jump right into it because we've got two really, really, really um, special uh, guests that's coming on and they're gonna be sharing their stories with us as well, is to remember that. However you feel right now, if you're watching this and you know that you are concerned about having these kind of thoughts, we encourage you to 
keep plugged in, keep tuned in to the rest of this program today and what's to come next week because there's something in it for you. Call your friends and tell your friends to log on. And remember, excuse the children who are in the room right now who may be um, in earshot because the content of this show is actually for adults, adults only. All right, Mia? Yes, definitely. Thank you both so much. Um, you know, when we think of the choice to live, it's very personal to me because mental challenges affect some of my close friends, colleagues, you know, associates, family members, and I too face mental challenges and had thoughts of suicide. Now, I want to share, according to um, Howard T. H. Chan School of Public Health, um, did you know that most common ways to commit suicide is um, one, 52% use of firearm uh, more than any other method combined, uh, 23 accounts for suffer, um, suffocation or hanging, 18% poison overdose, 2% for jumps, and 4% of someone cutting themselves. And the most non-fatal self-harm treated in the emergency room department results from 64% of poisoning and overdose, followed by 19% cutting themselves and 1% of less non-fatal attempts with a gun. Now, um, let's take a quick break. And um, when we come back, Lenny will introduce our first guest who has been to the edge and back several times. We'll be back in 60 seconds. The Jamaican American Association of Central Florida proudly presents Jamaica's 60th Independent Scholarship and Deputants Award Gala on August 6, 2022 at the Rosen Plaza Hotel from 7 p.m. to 1 a.m. Guest speaker will be Dr. Dwayne Dice, CEO of Education Solution International. Co-MCs are Mr. Lewis Witcher and Miss Adriana Clark of Caribbean Rhythms Radio. Dinner served at 7.30 p.m. Music and dancing by DJ Charlie Brown and Caribbean Groove Band. Tickets are $75 by calling 407 467 1741 or 321-439-2130 and also 407-292-3719. Join us for a night of excellence and elegance as we celebrate Jamaica's Diamond Jubilee. For more information, please visit online at www.jaaocf.com. Yes, thank you very much. Today, our second episode is entitled Suicide to the Edge and Back. It tells the story of two extraordinary women who faced the challenge of attempted suicide, but chose to live. Why and what message they have for all of us? Our first guest is Evangelist Laquana, Lady Q Gloucester. I think that Q also stands for queen because she's definitely one of the queens in our community. She's founder of Sisters of Faith and Pink in Pearls. She's a certified life story and relationship coach. She's a journalist and a broadcaster for KUOMagazine.com. She's a poet, a creative artist, and the 2018 KUO Magazine's Women of Culture 365 US Ambassador, US Ambassador. And she is co-host and producer of the Globe 365 TV shows. Welcome, Lady Q. Uh, she's muted, so I can't hear her. Thank you for having me. It is definitely um, a pleasure to be here to be able to share, you know, um, my story and this part of my life with everyone today. Okay, thank you. Again, I, once again, like uh, Sister Sophie said, we're going to remind the audience that the following episode, uh, it includes adult related and rated content that might not be suitable for children. So viewer discretion is advised. 
Okay, so uh, Lady Q, please share with our audience what it was like for you, as you shared, to look for love. You've spoken of looking for love in the wrong places. How did this affect your state of mind to even contemplate suicide? And how does that relate to the first signs of mental illness issues? Wow, that was, Lydia, that was a lot in, in one question. But um, let me say this. Um, at the age of four, um, I was molested. Um, I was around a lot of things that a young person shouldn't be around. So I was introduced to adult things and adult content at a very young age. But I think most, in, most, you know, the thing that impacted me the worst was being molested. Um, it put me in a state of shock. Um, there were things that I went through throughout that, following that, that one or two things typically happen to people when they have been molested and or raped, because later on in life, I was also raped. And so what typically happens, either they shut down and they seclude themselves or they become promiscuous. So unfortunately, I became that person that was promiscuous. So throughout my time um, of growing up, that by the age of uh, 13, I was already having sex. I was already drinking. I was already uh, uh, smoking marijuana. Um, growing up in a in an abusive environment seeing a lot of things that I should not have seen, that it impacted me greatly to a point that I just began to seek um, love in all the wrong places. And so a lot of times being in that position, the only time I felt love was when I was physically intimate with someone. So the moment that that, that ended, I felt empty all over again. So I continued to keep searching um, Drinking to the point that I was an alcoholic, um, smoking marijuana to the point that it would numb me um, because I just needed these spaces to be filled. And so over time, eventually ending up in bad relationships with men that were vo verbally abusive to the point of going to the edge of actual physical abuse of being grabbed um, inappropriately and aggressively and being told literally that I needed to go kill myself. Mm -hmm. um, that for me, that was the breaking point because feeling rejected and abandoned took me to the space of, well, what do I have to live for? You know, people keep rejecting me. People keep abandoning me. I have this sense of like emptiness. So it took me to that place where like, what, why should I even live? I might as well just go ahead and give up on life because no one cares anyway. So it took me to that place that in my mind, I really believed that, that I was uh, not enough, that I was unwanted, that I was unloved, um, that I didn't matter um, to the point that I didn't even think that when I walked into a room that people even saw me. I didn't think anything of myself. I thought I was ugly. I, I picked out all the, all the things about me that I thought was wrong. And so also with that being said, I realized that even as I got older and being developed, that men would only stare at my chest. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't even look me in the face. So every conversation with me was staring at my chest. And so I was like, well, okay, well, I don't mean anything to anybody but sex. Um, and again, by me looking for love in all the wrong places, I gave in to the wrong type of men. I found myself with the wrong type of men over and over again who were verbally abusive. So I ended up just um, in my process of attempting suicide to just go ahead and take these pills and consume as much alcohol as possible and even prayed for God to take my life. And it wasn't that I wasn't even in church. I was going to church. And so... Even around me, people would always say, well, all you got to do is pray about it. Just pray about it. Just pray about it. Got to take care of it. You know, or those are just just demons in your life that you need to pray about. But the problem was. Is that no one was teaching me the steps so that I could get healing so that I can get through. So I was in a place of bondage at the same time. And I didn't know I didn't know how to get out. And for me, praying wasn't doing it. So I just decided, well, you know, then no one, even the church don't care. So I might as well just be mm -hmm. done. So that leads me to the next question. 
which I <clears throat> excuse me, which I think is a very deep issue. If you mentioned the men would look at you, but they wouldn't look at you, they look at your breasts. Yes. As if you were your breasts. <laughs> and, and that leads me, in other words, the, the breast is part of your costume. Right. So what I want to ask you, uh, you said, you have said that to survive, you've had to build <clears throat> a healthy sense of self. Right. But you know, many people see the self as merely being the mind, the body, your personality, <clears throat> your accomplishments, your possessions, right. your bank book. I would like you to share with our audience your thoughts about a deeper meaning of the self and how if people had a deeper meaning of the self, it could deter, deter people from dangling on that edge of suicide. Wow. Um, yeah, that's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a deep one. Um, because oftentimes people don't come to a deeper meaning of their self until they're like later on in life. So with that being said, for me, um, it's knowing who I am internally, not just, I know what I look like on the outside. I know when I get dressed what I look like and I know what I look good in and what I don't look <clears throat> or what I feel like I don't look good in. Right. So to go deeper than just the outward appearance is one. My relationship for me had to be um, very important as far as my relationship with God. I had to have that intimate relationship with God. So for me, it was who does God say that I am? So in understanding that who does God say that I am, God says that I am more than a conqueror. God says that I am victorious. God says that he's given me beauty for ashes, which means all that I have gone through in my past and all that I've been through doesn't necessarily make up all of who I am. It has taught me the decisions that I need to make in life and who who do I allow in my space, right? So with that being said, those things that I have gone through in life, God is saying that you don't have to stay in that place because I have a better place for you. And also not only that, learning to love self, because the first thing that God says is that love your neighbor as you love yourself. So loving me, loving me first, treating me having to be the priority because a lot of times when we are in that place of dealing with abuse and rejection and abandonment what we're often dealing with is the labels that people put on us this person said that i'm not enough but god says i'm more than enough this person says i'm worthless but god says i'm far more worth rubies and sapphires which means i'm priceless this person says that i'm nothing but god says i'm a daughter of the most high and that he loves me in spite of and because of and so learning who i am from the inside but most importantly but who god says i am walking in the power and authority that god has given me of knowing who i am in him so when i know who i am in him and i know all that god has placed inside of me then there's nothing that man can do to place a label on me making me think that i'm something that i'm not so most importantly, know who I am in God and knowing myself internally and loving me to the fullest and knowing not only am I enough, but I am more than enough. I may not be enough for the person that I'm engaging because what I am projecting or giving or sharing, they refuse to accept it. But because they refuse to accept it doesn't mean that I'm not more than enough. Thank you so much. You've actually said that um, you've actually tried several times to commit suicide. Yes. Can you please share with us at least one or more cases in, in at least one or more cases? What was the moment of truth that led you to decide to not metaphorically pull the trigger? You could have pulled it and gone all the way, but you didn't. OK. Um, what was the moment of truth in the, some of those cases? Wow. Let me share first the the worst case of me attempting suicide is I consumed as much alcohol as I could consume and taking a handful of pills 
Um, and there was a friend of mine that lived with me at the time. Um, she wasn't supposed to be in the house. She was supposed to be gone for the weekend. And she so happened to come to the house. I don't even remember her coming to the house. I remember waking up the next day and trying to gather my thoughts and figure out where I was and um, what was going on. And then I realized that I was alive. And she, I didn't even realize she was in the house at the time. And so I went to go into the room and I heard her and I asked her what happened. And she expressed to me how she force fed me for me to regurgitate whatever it was that I consumed um, and had me in the bathroom, um, in the, in the, in the, in the, in, the, in the, with my face in the toilet bowl half the night. I don't remember anything. I don't remember her coming in the house. I don't remember any of that. And so following that, it was about a week later that I went to attempt suicide again. And she looked me in my face. And at the time I was a single mom and my son was mm, two, two years old. So she said to me, she said, do you believe that anyone can love your son greater than you can love your son? Do you believe that anyone can replace you as his mother, regardless of your flaws, regardless of your flaws? Can anyone give to him the unconditional love that you can give him? Mm. And it was in that moment that it broke me down because there was not at any point that I attempted suicide that I actually thought about my son. I didn't think about where he was going to be. I didn't think about who was going to take care of him. It mental illness is um it's 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 so severe that even those that are closest to you you don't even think about. So I had no concept. And in that moment, I realized that if I was to take my life and was to be successful, who would love him? Who would give him an unconditional love? Who would give him what he needed as a mom? But not only that, all of his life, he would think, my mother didn't love me enough to stay for me. That for me was the wake up call to realize it's not worth it because I know what it felt to be rejected and abandoned and unloved. So my son would then be facing the same thing, not just in thought or emotion, but in the literal sense. And I didn't want him to even feel a fraction of the pain that I felt. So that was, that was initially my wake up call. Okay, that that really does support what many different therapists have said around the world, and that is that uh, it's not just about you, just not just about us. No, it's about the village, our family, the village. Yes, the people around us. Yes, and it is said that it takes a village and community awareness to help people survive and thrive in any community and avoid things like suicide. Right. What would you like to share with our thinkers, planners, doers, family people in our community? What would you like to share with them that they can do to foster a deeper meaning of self? Because you spoke about, uh, as you put it, that extra inside of you. Right. And you've explained this very beautifully in terms of that spiritual dimension. So what would you what would you like to share with our thinkers and planners and doers and family members, uh, what they can do to, to help deter people who they love, including themselves, from all forms of self-destruction, right. especially dangling on the edge of suicide? Um, first and foremost, um, it's to be present. The biggest thing that uh, I realize a lot of people have made the mistake. Um, we want to tell people what to do, but we don't want to be present with them through the process. And so a lot of times we have to be present with that person, allow them to feel whatever they feel. 
Um, the one thing that I share with everybody, no one's feelings is wrong or right. They just are. Right. And so with that process, I also share with people that I even now mentor and counsel to get a journal and write down where you are and how you feel and have goals. What is your goal just for today? Um, what would what would you like to do for today? So when we're talking to people, ask them, what is one goal that you want to achieve in the next hour or within the next 24 hours and walk through them with this process. And it's not going to be easy and it's not overnight. So therefore we also have to have patience with somebody that's dealing with mental illness, that's possibly facing suicide. Do not brush that person off when the signs are there. Don't ignore them. And definitely do not, which is one of the biggest mistakes that we make because we may be hurting for that person. We have a tendency of yelling at them and calling them selfish. And if that person's already hurting, they don't need any more negative impact. So we have to be positive. We have to encourage. We have to empower. We have to be present and we have to be patient. Well, Lady Q, thank you so much. I would like to underscore something you said, which is so much deeper than people realize. You talked about emotions and allowing people to express how they feel because mm -hmm. emotions are not wrong or right. That's how <laughs> they feel. And yes. think about this, folks. I won't say much, but emotion. If you are not in touch with your emotions, your emotion is going to be affected. You will yeah. not be able to get in motion in a positive way. So thank you, Lady Q, so much. You are very welcome. I, um, this was this was um, everything for me. I, and I'm, I just wanted to share this. It's taken me a long time to really openly and transparently share this part of, of my life because what people fail to realize, even though you've been through and God has brought you through, um, the other side to that is carrying the weight of what are people going to say when you say that you've attempted suicide? Because there's another aspect of that. And so being having the strength and trusting God that he's going to carry me through the process has been the other aspect. And so is this has definitely been a blessing All for right. me. I feel you. <laughs> so let's take a quick break. And when we return, Sister Sophie will introduce our next guest, who also has attempted suicide. Thank you. Hello and welcome. My name is Ronnie Walker. Allow me to introduce you to the Mr. Relationship Man Cave .com website. Listen, gentlemen, today is not the day to show up halfway for yourself and for the woman you aim to please. Nutrition and mental health are important to fully experience a healthy and exceptional relationship. As a man, we want to make sure we have what is needed to start and finish strong. So go to www.mrrelationshipmancave.com and explore the possibilities. Welcome back. And I, uh, you just heard a really passionate story from our sister Lady Q just now. We are in part two of a, a three part series because it's, it's mental wellness month. And uh, this uh, special series is actually, today's episode is called To the Edge and Back. We're gonna be talking with another special guest, but before that, let me just remind you that uh, this season, this show is actually catering to um, and centered um, around delicate topics and conversations. So uh, viewers' discretion is advised that it is really geared towards adult listening. Our next guest is uh, Coach Mia Mixon, affectionately called Ria. She's a health advocate, Speciality, 
um, business coach, a herbalist, owner of the tea company, meal prepping company, 2019 ribbons of survivors, 365, cervix ovarian cancer ambassador, and she's the owner of several businesses. We're inviting you to listen as she shares her story on what led her to attempt to commit suicide several times. Ria, we welcome you to the show. Ria, can you hear us? Yes, I hear you. Okay, awesome. Welcome to the show, sister. Welcome, welcome. Thank welcome. you. Thank you for having me. It's, um, it's an honor. I know this is such a delicate conversation that you're going to be having with us, um, you know, and, and let me just start by saying thank you for taking the time to be here and to about to open up to us. Thank I want to ask you, though, that before, with all of that being said, with all of your accolades that you received, you know, who is Rhea? Who was Rhea before all those accomplishments of being a wife and a mother to be able to celebrate in your Puerto Rico? You have, you know, Puerto Rican heritage and all that. And, um, you know, for instance, instance, tell us about your childhood. What is it about Rhea that we don't know? Take us back. I want to say take us back. I mean, take us back to where you're emotional and, you know, before and right about before your emotional and psychological uh, journey really began. Talk to us. Well, um, I believe they all started when trauma started happening. Um, I did get molested. Um, I did get raped early in my life. And I was very promiscuous as, you know, in a young age, very young, um, did drugs very young. Um, drank very young. Um, I was exposed to a lot of things that a child should not have been exposed to. Wow, that sounds uh, kind of like a similar to what Lady Q just shared with the, the, the pattern as to what really did, you know, how that life can affect us at early ages. Yes. Let me ask you something. Can you remember at um, how early it all started like was there a specific moment um, of time that you can go back to like you could say I was age this that led to you know you even your first major incident that really sticks out that you could share with us um I so a, a lot of the things um didn't come to me until later on in life because uh, I blocked a lot you know but when they were coming back to me, it was very overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, but I do remember I was in kindergarten. Uh, the first time I would say that I was touched. Wow. Can you remember, um, I know you shared with us uh, before that uh, something happened to you that led you to the emergency room at around at a very delicate tender age. I think it was like around age uh, 12. 12. Yeah. Can you um, share with us? Yes. So I was tired of hurting. I was tired of feeling disgusted in my own skin and I wanted it to end I didn't want to feel like that anymore and you know I took a whole bunch of my mother's pills and I just wanted it just to stop the pain to stop wow at age 12 yeah, it was just too much for me, too much, because I kept reliving it in my head, different things that was, that happened to me. And then even at that time, at 12, I was dating a 19-year-old 
who was a drug dealer and he would, you know, put his hands on me. Sorry to hear all of that. Where were you at that time? With my mom. She had, um, you know, my, my mom did the best that she could with the information that she had. And I would never speak um, the opposite of her because I love her dearly. I took care of her when she got really sick. She suffered a lot of trauma in her life. So she couldn't see my traumas. Hmm. 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 Oh, so uh, I can see the pain in you even speaking about it right now. And again, I want to say, you know, to all our viewers and to you right now, sister, who's taking the time to share your story, because that's why this platform is here. Thank you for being vulnerable and being naked right now, transparent. You mentioned, you just shared something very touching just now that, uh, you know, it was you, your mom, she did all she could. And she was, yeah. obviously there was a lot going on. Mm -hmm. Did you know, can you recall, I'm going off script a little bit here. Can you go, can you, you at that tender age where you felt and you were feeling all that you were feeling. Was there an earlier part where you said you realized that something, and I know I kind of asked on this last week, where um, you kind of knew something, you weren't feeling, or whatever you were feeling or what was going on was not the norm in what you probably would consider many households. Um, and I know you just shared with us that you didn't feel at that age you chose to do what you contemplated doing that you tried to do at age 12 because of stuff that were happening. Take us back to during that time, just a little bit more, please. I know it's delicate, but for somebody who's listening, we just heard the news just now about what just happened to kids in that tender age somewhere in America about parents who just lost their kids. God bless the entire families that maybe you don't have to start right now. But we're talking about a, a baby, still tender, tender, tender. And, and obviously not knowing who you could reach to because you said you weren't able, it sounded like you weren't able to share with mom at that time. What was your mask? Um, I was very, I was very quiet. Um, I've always loved to dance. Mm. Um, to this day, you know, everyone that knows me knows that I do events and things like that and I dance. Um, dancing would take me to a, a nice place in my head. Mm. But, you know, um, the way I was raised and I, I I really didn't know what wasn't normal and what was normal. <laughs> you know, um, I thought the way I was living was life. I thought everybody was the same. Hmm. You know, you shared with us about, uh, take us back to, let's fast forward a little bit more to age 19, where you were feeling depressed. You know, you said you were, it, uh, escalated a little bit different, a little bit higher where you, you were hearing voices. And it you know, I, I wouldn't say that it was voices. I would say that it was me talking to myself, mm. you know, pretty much saying, um, at the time I did have, you know, a young child. But at the time, I didn't even think that he deserved me. I wanted him to 
not have a mother that was hurting the way I was. It was scary for me to think that, you know, um, that I could continue living, feeling the way I was feeling. Tell us about that moment that led you to I just wanted the pain to stop, you know. It was always, that was one of the, um, my thing all the time. It was like, I just wanted it to stop. And some days it was, you know, really hard to bear. Um, it was almost like so many different instances happened to me it was just taken over my head. And then, you know, back then, again, I didn't have no one around me that could um, give me good advice. And um, I just wanted it to stop. And again, I took, you know, a whole bunch of pills and I just closed my door and went into my closet. Maria, and I went to sleep. Pause right there for a moment. I want you to talk to us a little bit more about that. But before you go any further with that, we're going to take a real quick break and come back. And you really give us, walk us through that day after the break. Stick around, guys. who has been sharing a really emotional uh, story, her life with us, as to what it has been for her growing up as a child and going through all the things she went through that led her to feeling as if she didn't want to be around anymore. You know, uh, Rhea, you were telling us right before that uh, you got up one day and you didn't feel like you wanted to be here anymore and you walked into a closet. Can you share with us what it was like when you before you got to that point, that morning, when you got up that day, what was that day like morning when you got up out of bed? Was it a day that you woke up and you said, okay, this is the day I'm gonna do this. I don't wanna be here anymore. Or what led up to that point with you walking into that closet? At the time, I didn't think I deserved to be alive and that's just the truth I despised myself I couldn't even look at myself in the mirror without cringing mm -hmm. and I hated feeling like that so when you got up that morning did you think that was the day you were going to be doing that or did something happen throughout that day that made that kind of pushed you to the point where uh, you know, you know, we, we call it to the edge. What pushed you to that edge on that day? That particular day? It was just, again, the way I was feeling. And I didn't like it. And that particular day, I just didn't want to feel anymore. Okay. So you got up, you said you took, was your mom's pills? Yeah. And you said you counted them. It was about 40, 42, something like that. Then you said you walked and you went to the closet. Can you tell us what happened after that? 
yeah, I guess I fell asleep. And I woke up throwing up. My sister found me. And all I kept hearing her say is, what did you do? What did you do? And I was just vomiting a lot over the toilet. Hmm. I was, I think I was vomiting for a couple of days. Hmm. Okay. Um, so you went to that emotional edge, that clip. When you came, when you got back and subsequent to that with your sister finding you, this is something I'm going to ask you this because I know um, this is a question that I think uh, me, a lot of persons who probably found yourself in, this, in your position may deal with. Was there anything that happened after that? that uh, how was your relationship with your sister right before that? I mean, after that, um, do you find yourself where... Um, is it, have you felt like you've been in more turmoil or ha, do you feel like you've, you've been scrutinized or monitored more by her since then? No, because she had her own issues and she understood me. Um, to this day, we're close. I mean, we've had numerous sibling stuff where we didn't talk to each other for a couple of years but we always found each other again and um she still checks up on me <laughs> bless her do you um feel as though you've been experiencing our or do you, have you ever experienced survival guilt because of that, because of going there and coming back and looking around you and seeing some of the things that's going on around. Have you ever experienced survival guilt in any way at all for not going all the way over the edge, completing the act? I wouldn't call it guilt. Um, I just kept trying to figure out why it actually didn't happen because it almost happened a few times in my life, you know? And as I was getting older, um, you know, I, I was experiencing many different things happening to me as far as like with illnesses and, and feeling physical pain was actually helping me at the time because it didn't allow me to feel any hurt in my heart anymore, if that makes sense. <laughs> I think so. Was that where your ovarian survival story began? Um, a little bit before that, a little bit before that, because, you know, um, I went through a lot of different surgeries, you know, in my life. So um, I went through even spine surgery. Um, during my time with cancer, it wasn't that I was still suicidal, but I wasn't afraid of dying. Hmm. I wanted to stay alive. I wanted to fight, but I wasn't scared. I kept telling myself, maybe this is going to take me out. Let me just, you know, relax and just let it happen. But it didn't. I survived again and again and again and again. You're a survivor. <laughs> You're a survivor, sister, and for a purpose. And, and, and I think maybe one of the purposes is for doing what you're doing right now. Uh, I know we're going to take a quick break, but before that, because, uh, we, you know, um, and, and unfortunately, this is just a 60 minute show. But let me ask you something. Uh, did you ever, were you ever, ever able to confide in anyone? Did you ever get some form of a, somebody to confide in, whether it was professional or did you have a, 
a, a confidant that you were able to relate to was it relate to how you were feeling be your true self with well i learned a long time ago that if i would have said something to someone they eventually left my life because it was almost like it was too heavy for them and i learned that everyone in life is not made to know the real you hmm. but you also know that you know they're just not supposed to be in your life, you know, if they don't want to stand by you. Um, the couple of people that I did confide in, they left my life. Um, and then when I did get professional help, it, it, for me personally, it didn't help me because I used to feel worse when I left. But it was almost like I guess it did serve a purpose because the more I listened to myself, I started loving myself more. Mm. I started appreciating things that I did more. And it was almost like maybe I did need to hear the words that were coming out of my mouth, even though I don't think I got any help from them per se. It helped me to find me. It helped me to figure out how am I going to live with all this information in my brain, things that happen to me. And um, sometimes in the middle of the night, it'll wake me up. How do I go on? And I learned, I learned that, you know, how I react is everything. Um, I learned how to react differently instead of wanting to inflict pain. Hmm. But I've learned how to embrace. I've learned how to say, well, all those things couldn't kill me. So I guess I might as well grow up to be something. Amen. Amen. I know we're gonna we're gonna have to um, to wrap it up real quick, um, unfortunately. Um, but I want, we're gonna take a real quick break, and I think we're gonna be rolling over an extra few minutes into the show because I want you to tell us right after the break what was it that gave you the time to stop, or the motive to stop and do yourself your temperature check. What was it that pulled you back from that edge that brought you to this point right now, where you just said what you just said? We take a real quick break and come back right after this. The Jamaican American Association of Central Florida proudly presents Jamaica's 60th Independent Scholarship and Deputants Award Gala on August 6, 2022 at the Rosen Plaza Hotel from 7 p.m. to 1 a.m. Guest speaker will be Dr. Dwayne Dice, CEO of Education Solution International. Co-MCs are Mr. Lewis Witcher and Miss Adriana Clark of Caribbean Rhythms Radio. Dinner served at 7.30 p.m. Music and dancing by DJ Charlie Brown and Caribbean Groove Band. Tickets are $75 by calling 407-467-1741 or 321-439-2130 and also 407-292 three seven one nine join us for a night of excellence and elegance as we celebrate jamaica's diamond jubilee for more information please visit online at www.jaaocf.com thank you right before the break we were talking to ria and ria was just uh telling us that it seemed as though you were able to identify, based on what you were talking just now, how to handle your, the situation after life experience of all those, uh, you know, instances. Um, would you say that you found what the root, what was, what was the root, the cause root of what was going on um, in your life, and how to deal with? Did you find the, the root to the cause or cause to the root? that led you to where you are today as to how to 
look at things in the way in which you're, you're looking at it now. What was your, and what was your moment of truth that pulled you back to where you are right now? In other words, your wake up call, what snapped you out of it to where you are? Taking care of my mom. Wow. Um, one moment, we can't hear. We're not hearing Rhea. Do you hear me now? Do you hear me now? Uh, I think Rhea is muted. Do you hear me? Do you hear me now? Okay. Do you hear me now? Okay. Do you hear I'm me so now? sorry. I don't know. Uh, Lenny, can you, can it, is anyone else hearing Rhea? Yes. Let, let her just keep talking. We're running out of time, but I, I can hear her. So I'm okay. sure okay. others can hear her. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So you do hear me? Yes, please continue. Okay. Um, she asked me what was my um, awakening. Um, what made me want to continue to live. And that was when I took care of my mom. When she was going through um, Alzheimer's until she died. Um, my mom went through a lot of trauma in her life and she also went through um, the trauma that really broke her was seeing my brother, her son, um, who committed suicide. So she was never um, the same after she saw that. And um, she went into Alzheimer's early in her life and taking care of her just um, really changed me. Well, hello. I think we're just about running out of time. So uh, normally we like to have a nice uh, substantive round table, but I think what, what we're going to do today is just ask our two guests uh, to do the takeaway for us, meaning uh, you've heard each other, you've experienced it. Please share with our audience, what do you take away from all that you've experienced, what you've heard today from each other? Please share with our audience what you take away from this that would help them to travel this road and have an outcome differently than the one that you had, please. Can you start, uh, Lady Q? Yes. Um, I would say uh, the biggest takeaway is really um, and knowing who you are is connecting with God and loving yourself first. Learn to love yourself first. And then someone that, that may be dealing with this situation um, of somebody who's facing suicide is to be patient with them and present with them, helping them walk through the process. Thank you. That's short and sweet. Yes. <laughs> Rhea? Yes. You can't blame yourself for what someone else did to you. And you got to forgive. You got to forgive yourself for, you know, having those type of feelings, you know, that you don't think you can live with. But as um, Lady Q said, um, you have to love yourself and that is a journey in itself because it took me a long time but thank god i did thank you so much and finally i know mia you've been doing some technical work but could you please give a short uh takeaway based upon your experience because you've been on this journey and could you include include in your takeaway i know we don't have a lot of time but that moment of truth was so beautiful when you turned the tide. Just tell us about that moment of truth and then give your takeaway. 
um, as my moment of truth on me or what I just yeah, heard? You. Yeah, on you. Oh, well, you know, my moment of truth um, came with, you know, the next show I'll be sharing, you know, what I went through. But um, I actually lost all sense of reality, you know, that I forgot I had children. And when your children walks in the room and says, mommy, I'm just like, okay, what was I thinking? Because that whole time I'm thinking about committing suicide, all kind of different ways <laughs> possible. So that was my moment of truth of, you know, getting me back to reality that, I, you know, this, no, I need to live. I have to choose life. Okay. And before we uh, go back to you and end, uh, Mia, um, Sophie, give us a very brief uh, takeaway that you have with your analytical mind. Uh, what's the bottom line that you get out of this? Thanks, Vernon. The bottom line is one of one out of every five person is dealing with something, and that means it's probably in your own home. If we have more than four people living in a home, somebody in the home is contemplating those thoughts. It could be your neighbors on the left or the right, in front of you or behind you. So uh, just be cautious as to how we love one another, how we relate to one another, and know that even behind a smile and a dance that there could be really sadness going on inside. And as um, you know, we ask the question, the tough question, are you having these thoughts? It's a question that needs to be had. And I think if we nip it in the bud or coming bold enough to ask, just putting it out there, it's an opportunity for, for someone to say yes or no. All right. Or at least to get some formal response. Thank Much you. more to come on next week's episode. So what I would say is before we ask um, uh, to tell us, uh, for our folks to tell us about what's coming up next week on the next show, I would say this. Remember, mark my words, you can't kill yourself. You can't because yourself is not your costume. It's not your person, not your body, mind. Yourself, as they said on the walls, in Egypt, man know thyself. Your divine spirit is who you are. And you can't kill that. So stop trying. Those of you who are even thinking about it. Next show is coming up. Can we, uh, it's coming up Tuesday, May 31st, part three, suicide, the moment of truth, the choice to live. In this episode, you will hear the story of our very own coach, Mia Allman, in detail, who had thoughts of suicide, which changed the course of her life. And we'll talk about raising awareness about mental illness and other chronic illnesses, conditions with, and, and conditions with her Ribbon of Survivors 365 documentary. And finally, uh, we, will, we want you to also understand that uh, wellness, a life of wellness, as each one of our guests here and hosts have explained, is a key element in surviving and thriving. Mia? You got to unmute, unmute me. My bad. I would like to thank our host, Leonard Burge, and coach um, Sophie G, our special guests, Lady Q and Rhea, for sharing their, you know, inspiring stories of warriors of hope and wellness, and just being able to um, have the courage to share that story, to help others that are there that may be contemplating suicide or having thoughts of suicide. So thank you both ladies for sharing your story. I would also like to say a happy early birthday to Lady Q, which is on June 1st. So happy early birthday, birthday, Lady Q. And also remember that National Suicide Prevention Life is available 24 hours per day at 800-273-8255 uh, 
or you can text TALK to 741741 to communicate with a trained crisis counselor. Until next time, stay safe and well and find your glow within the mind, body, and soul. Be here since day one.